It was about two months ago that I received uh, an invitation to come to this event and speak on the topic of innovation. And at first, I thought the idea was pretty silly. Uh, because I'm more or less a complete failure as an innovator. But then I thought about it a little bit more, and I realized that because of my status as a farmer and as a failed innovator, that I've been able to make a couple of observations about the topic of innovation. And so I decided I would like to come and share those observations with everyone here today, uh, as well as towards the end of my talk, uh, tell you about uh, some really interesting ways that the uh, internet has allowed for farmers to disseminate um, great ideas on farming. Okay, so observation number one. So the thing that I find really interesting is that all the ideas that we're here to talk about today and all of the things we tend to think about when we talk about technology and all of the incredible ideas that have been shared at TED Talks in the last 25 years and all of the everyday things that make our lives so much easier and really cool, like toasters and bicycles and smartphones. All of those things were made possible because of innovations that happen on farms. I say that because our civilization is based on agriculture. And at one time, the, small pop the, the relatively small population of the world had to spend the majority of its time producing food. But then, because of a whole bunch of innovations that happened on and for farms, innovations like widespread irrigation canals, and uh, the horse-drawn plow, and uh, the Haber-Bosch process that allowed us to extract nitrogen from the air, which allowed us to uh, create lots of synthetic fertilizers, and the modern tractor, and a whole bunch of other innovations, we became extremely efficient at producing food. And that meant two things. The first thing it meant was that a lot fewer people had to spend their time producing food. And the second thing it meant was that we were able to produce vast surpluses of food. And that meant that our population started to increase, and then it exploded at one point to the over six billion that it sits at today. And so what that meant was that all the people that, uh, that weren't producing food had to do something. And what they did, was they painted the Mona Lisa, and they found cures for fatal diseases, and they put people into space, and they figured out a way to put ready-made whipped cream into a spray can. <laughs> mm. Mm. What I like to think, what I like to think is that a few thousand years ago, some farmer figured out a way to produce more grain in the same amount of space, and he thought to himself, because I'm doing this, someday, some farmer who's really stressed out on the farm is going to be able to put whipped cream from a can in his mouth, <laughs> and it's going to ease his pain. And he was right. So that was, um, that was observation number one, that because of innovative farmers, we have TED Talks and whipped cream in a can. Observation number two. I think that when we tend to talk about uh, innovation, we tend to focus a lot on the really, that tiny percentage of really successful ideas. And we tend to focus not so much on the thousands or maybe even millions of ideas that fail. And that, that kind of makes some sense why we do that. But I do think it's important to focus on innovation in a more general sense. That is, to define innovation as any attempts to figure out better ways to do things. And the reason that I think that's important is because when we focus only on the great successes, it distorts the reality of how those great ideas and great innovations happen. Because the reality is, is that all the failures that happen, all the trial and error, uh, is vital to producing those ideas. And so the reason that matters is that ideals com ideas come from people, but people really need to feel comfortable sharing those ideas. And when we distort the way that ideas happen, we can intimidate them and make them feel a little bit more shy about sharing their ideas. You know, I've, I come up with ideas every once in a while, and it's, it's quite common when I do to, for the people around me to, to, to say things like, yeah, that'll never work, that's a stupid idea. Or if it's like my dad, like, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> 
And that can be really intimidating for people. And it also, they, you know, you get, they start to get this idea that they could be humiliated. And so it discourages people from sharing ideas. So, so that's observation um, number two, is that we need to focus more on the failure. We need to actually celebrate failure when it comes to innovation because it provides such a crucial role. If we do that, I think we can foster more innovation. Okay, so now I'd like to bring the topic uh, more specifically uh, uh, to farming. Um, because it turns out that a farm is a perfect place to witness this kind of run-of-the-mill, everyday, very likely to fail type of innovation that I'm talking about. And I should say that I'm mostly going to talk about small-scale farming. And that's partly because that's the kind of farming that I do. I'm a small-scale farmer. But another reason I wanna, I'm talking about small-scale farming is that the tr you know, a, ma a major trend in our civilization has been towards much larger, much more specialized farms. So one consequence of that is that a lot of the commercially available innovation is focused on that type of farming. And so I would argue that small-scale farmers have to be a little bit more self-reliant when it comes to innovating. So my partner Vanessa and I are farmers, and we've been farming for about four years, and we innovate all the time. And when I say that, I mean in that general, very likely to fail sort of way. And I think, I think most farmers innovate all the time. And probably a lot of other people have the same impulse with their jobs, but like a major difference is that if you work in an office and you cannot stand the layout of the buttons on your keyboard, you're not very likely to be able to rig a new keyboard up from scrap material lying around your desk. Whereas on a farm, I'm, I'm sure you can all picture a farm you've seen where it just like looks like an absolute chaotic mess. But that's what it looks like to you. To a, to a lot of farmers, that's just materials for innovation. And that's what ends up happening. You, you know, farmers are able to take stuff together and, and conceivably put together a solution to some problem they're having without investing too much time. So one reason that farmers uh, innovate is because when you're on a farm, you tend to have a lot of daily, repetitive, mundane and, and often physically demanding tasks. And so what tends to happen is you just find yourself thinking, man, I could be doing this faster, this is driving me nuts, or geez, my back hurts, I wish I could find a way to do this where my back wouldn't hurt so much. Then an and, and then this, uh, another reason that, uh, that farmers tend to, to be very innovative is that in a lot of cases, the profit margin in farming is very narrow. And, so, and one thing that, that can really affect that profit margin is wage labor. And so you find a lot of farmers who try and do way too much in too little time. And so uh, they are all also constantly trying to think of ways to be more innovative and get more done. And I was talking to Vanessa about that the other day. And she was saying that in her head, there's this magical end game where we have achieved ultimate efficiency. And we get all kinds of spare time and we're just raking money in hand over fist. And it never happens. We never get there. But we, we still keep trying to innovate because it's really fun. And because at the very least, we can just laugh at each other and our friends can laugh at us when they see some of the ridiculous things that we come up with. So on the topic of ridiculous things that we come up with, I thought I would share a, one or two examples of, of what I'm talking about. So uh, we just moved to the Okanagan Valley this past year to start our own farm. And we had the fall free, we didn't have a farm yet. And we needed some work. And the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia is really well known for producing wine. And we got jobs as grape pickers. And two things that you should know about grape picking. Uh, the first thing is that generally you get paid by the amount of grapes that you pick. And you have to pick a lot of grapes to get paid well. Uh, and the second thing is that if you're quite tall like I am, it can be really hard to pick grapes quickly because the grapes tend to be fairly low. And so if you want to pick grapes quickly, you have to like stand like this all day, and by the end of the day, your back's just tapping out. So I did about one or two days of this, and it was, I mean, it was just driving me nuts because I wasn't picking grapes very fast, and my back hurt, and I just wanted to find a solution. So I started talking to some of the more experienced pickers, and I, you know, I, I asked one of them, I said, you know, do, do people ever use something to sit on? And he said, well, yeah, but you don't want to have to be bothering with your hands. And he, and he, he told me that someone had strapped a stool to their belt. And that then, because, that, you know, what's happening? You've got this long line of grapes, and you've got your bin, and you're just, you're moving around, and so the idea would be, I guess, that that person would quickly grab the stool and sit and pick and, and go on. But that didn't seem to make sense to me, because it means you're busy constantly grabbing your stool. So <laughs> uh, exactly. That, that was, I wish that was intentional. That was accidental. <laughs> anyway, I had this eureka moment, 
And I thought, an exercise ball. If I had an exercise ball and if it was attached to me, then, then I, could, you know, I could get on the ball and, and, and dance on, and that should work. And, you know, I was talking about looking, humi- you know, feeling humiliated before. Well, the next day, I went home that night, I went and got an exercise ball, I wrapped a bunch of rope around it, and I got a carabiner on it. And the next day, I stepped out of the vehicle to this crew of, like, <laughs> grape pickers, and, you know, they've been doing it for years, and there's cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, and out I come with this gigantic blue ball hanging from my belt. <laughs> And I mean, I got a range of, of reactions, but some people were just laughing at me. This other guy was like, wow, you got a ball! And the best was the foreman. He just, he walked right up to me and he said, that's never going to work. And then I, I swear to God, every, every 15 or 20 minutes, he'd come up and he'd go, how's your blue ball? <laughs> but here's the thing. It worked. It was genius. I was flying. All of a sudden, my back didn't hurt. And the beautiful thing about the ball is that you could make it hop you to like the next space in line. <laughs> So the problem was that it worked for an hour, <laughs> and, it, and I punctured it. I punctured the ball. And then I thought, OK, so that's too bad. Went home that night, got another ball, got a roll of duct tape. I duct taped, duct taped the heck out of that thing, and put the rope on the inside of the duct tape, and I showed up again. And the foreman was just like, oh, God. <laughs> and it worked for like two hours. And then I punctured it again. So, I kind of gave up at that point because it was like I was spending a lot of money on exercise balls and it was kind of <laughs> totally counteracting what I was making and great picking money. But anyway, I always wanted to do like the next prototype. So I put together, I mean this is essentially the same thing, but I went and found a store that sold really tough fabric. And I tried again. And uh, I'm very excited to, to try this in the, in the garden, because this will also have applications in the garden, but I'll be able to show you kind of how it works. Um, imagine me with like a really dirty shirt and some, some clippers, and this is the roll of grapes, and basically I'm sitting, and it's like I'm cutting, and I got my bin, and then it's just, I quickly, whoops, oh, oh. <laughs> and then I can quickly go, and then I can move, and I can quickly go, and it helps move, and anyway, it worked really well, so if I grape pick again, I'm going to be picking a lot of grapes. (laughs) So one more example I'm going to just say really quick, um, and this is more of an example of farmers trying to make money go a long way, because I had to plant some green manure seed. And green manure seed is seed that you put down, generally grain seed, that you grow just to turn into the soil to feed the soil. And on a small scale farm, you do it in really small spaces like a pathway. And I I had scattered a bunch of green manure seed, and we didn't have there are rollers you can use for, uh, for, doing, for, for um, tamping down the soil. Green manure seed, a lot of green manure seed really likes a firm soil bed. And we, we didn't have a roller, and they're very expensive. So I thought, ah, I, I need something because I, it'll improve your germination if you, can, if you can figure out how to tamp it down. So I came up with this. So I left the garden, and I spent <laughs> half an hour, and... Um, the way it works is that, you know, well, it should be pretty self-evident, but you put them on your feet, and away I went, and it was a terrible system. The things were sliding all around because I didn't have any, you know, proper bracing on my feet, and that was awful. So I, those, those got thrown out. But this is my new system. I took an old snowboard, and uh, I just hacked it up, and now I've got, like, proper bracing on the feet, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to try this out. So... That's kind of the next idea, but anyway, so that's kind of some of my own, you know, some of the fun I've had with trying, I mean, that's how, it's just, part of it is just having fun, but as you can see with the ball, you really, um, you really have to be willing to look like a complete idiot, and luckily I'm, I'm okay with that. So um, anyway, for the last part of my talk, I just want to tell you about uh, some really interesting examples of of how the internet has been wonderful for helping with the dissemination of farm ideas. The internet's been really good for farmers just because it's, it's rapidly increased the, uh, the, the, the speed at which people can share ideas, uh, as well as the, the volume of ideas that can get shared. And I'm really excited about wh- where things are going. The gentleman you're looking at, is uh, his name is Herrick Kimball. And he is a farmer in the United States. He's also uh, a blogger. And before I mention that uh, small-scale farmers have had to be quite self-reliant, uh, when it comes to innovation, that's not totally true. There are a lot of things available for, uh, commercially for small-scale farmers, but they're, they're very expensive. 
And Herrick has taken a look at a lot of the really good tools out there, and he's looked at them and said, I can build that myself for so much more cheaply. And he did. And you're looking at three different things that he's done. Um, he calls himself, the, he calls them all whiz-bang products. So that's the, the whiz-bang garden cart and the whiz-bang wheel hoe and the whiz-bang chicken plucker. And what he's done is he's, he's found a way to build these for a fraction of the cost of what you have to do if you order them from the store. And then he has created instruction booklets and he sells the instruction booklets to farmers. And I'll just quickly mention the chicken plucker. One, one really frustrating thing if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're slaughtering chickens on your small scale farm is getting the feathers off. And it's very expensive to get an industrial machine to do it for you. He built one at a quarter of the cost. I have a friend who ordered the instruction booklet and built it. And let me tell you, it was a delight depluming these, these chickens that day. It was really cool. This is uh, Martin Jakubowski. I won't say much about him just because uh, he's done a TED Talk of his own. He's doing something incredible. He has started a, a, uh, an organization called Open Source Ecology. They're working on a project called the Global Village Construction Set. And essentially, they've chosen 50 of the essential machines to, to uh, build a sustainable community that incorporates the modern comforts we're used to. And he's done an incredible job. They've got about four machines done, and they're, they're going towards 50. And the beautiful thing is that Marchin and his group want to make the, the blueprints for these open source, which means anyone can access them. He built his tractor for $12,000 in six days. And that blueprint is available right now online. The last thing I want to mention is a project that I've been working on. It's called The Ruminant. And essentially, I'm trying to create a space online for farmers to share some of these silly and not so silly ideas for their farms. Uh, th the way it works is I introduce a topic and I ask people to submit their photos on the topic of small scale innovation. So the one you're looking at was I asked farmers to share their ideas on germinating seeds. And I got all kinds of great ideas that probably won't mean much to most of you, but some of them are fascinating. And it, it gets people really excited about incorporating the ideas on their farms. So I have to admit that the site is not a great success yet. I don't have a huge readership. I have to chase down a lot of my farming friends to submit ideas. But I think it holds enormous potential. And in that way, I think this site is a lot like some of the ideas I tried out on my farm. In that the, the, the reason I have a motivation to keep working on them is that they, have, they hold a lot of potential. And I think uh, that's, that's what innovation is, OK? Innovation is millions of people trying out crazy ideas, and only a tiny percentage of them end up producing something really, really good. But those, those ti that tiny percentage changes the world. And it all started with a farmer who just wanted to figure out a way to have a few more free hours in his day. Thank you. <laughs>